Uh, hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we have a super special interview because Rosh was the first ever interview we did on this channel and now he is actually graduated. He's a free man and he's doing his training in the UK. Um, I So hi Rosh, <laughs> again. Um, hi, hi. I specifically wanted to talk to you because when we were messaging each other, you had a very positive uh, review of the UK training program, which I have to say, you're like one of the first people that I've talked to that is actually enjoying it. And it's also something that like we get a lot of questions about. Um, mm. So I don't know, would you like to, I don't know, give a brief introduction and then we can do more specific questions? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So um, I, I graduated from the University of Milan about two years ago now. Um, I graduated in October and entered into the um, foundation program the following August. So that's almost a year out of between university and training. Um, getting into to, to the foundation program for me was relatively easy because I'm British national. Um, I still had to jump through all the ho uh, hoops that international medical graduates have to. And um, I'm still labeled as an IMG or international medical graduate. But um, yeah, uh, I, I've, I've finished one year now and I'm in the first month of the second year. So just just over halfway uh, through the foundation program. And whilst it's been a lot of ups and downs and I have been overall enjoying it, there are a lot of, you know, down points to to the foundation program in comparison to other European programs. Um, but but yeah, we can get into the nitty gritty um, because there's a lot to talk about, I imagine. But um... yeah, definitely. Like it's always one of the most asked about things and discussed about things. And I would say that uh, other than staying in Italy, it's the most popular option of the IMS graduates. So it makes sense that there's going to be a lot of questions about it. Um, so I guess I'll start with just a random question that I think everyone is wondering. And I think you'll give it an honest answer, do. Do you... Like when you compare yourself to your peers, especially in the first few months, did you feel that the Italian like medical school system severely underprepared you? Um, did you feel like it was? But, you know, I guess also with the one year gap, you probably forgot a lot because I I mean, I studied for an exam and after one month I was like, when did I ever learn this? I don't even know this. So considering these factors, do you are you happy that you still went to IMS, um, like all things considered? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, IMS gave me an opportunity to study medicine where I failed to have those opportunities elsewhere. So I'm always thankful to to the International Medical School for for allowing me to study medicine and I'm prospering in medicine. Like it's it's it, it wasn't an easy road, regardless of which system you go through medicine. The medicine part doesn't change at all. Obviously, systems change from place to place. But um, I'm, I'm always thankful to, to to the Milan School for for giving me the opportunity. That being said, it prepares you for a different system. It prepares you for the Italian system, even though it's an international medical school, a lot of their basis for what is teaching and what is to what it means to learn medicine comes from a very Italian um, frame of mind where you, when you graduate, you go, you do one test, esamidistato, and then you go into the speciality of your choosing, which means that there's not a lot of avenue to learn other specialities and learn the what I consider to be the basics, which you would learn in the foundation program. So what that means in terms of what kind of doctor you become at the end of the day is up for a whole other discussion. <laughs> but um, I don't think the, the Milanese school prepared me for the foundation program, nor is it was it in, its intention. Um, in my first two months of the foundation training, given that I had taken it a, almost a year out and given that we don't do the same sort of finals that the Brits do, um, I felt very underwhelming compared to my my peers. I, I started off um, in my first rotation with two other peers at F1 level, one of whom was exceptionally good and one other who was about the same level as me, if not a little bit less. So I had almost the duality of seeing both sides of the British spectrum of um making doctors um which was quite fortunate to see because i felt very um anxious when i started i felt very underprepared and very um like i we, we we've had discussions on imposter syndrome beforehand and it came full force <laughs> during that those first uh, four months um so yeah i 
I even saw like a part of your foundation training, you you have to teach medical students as well who come to rotate throughout specialties, much like we did when we were in med school. And sometimes I felt like they knew more than me in, in the exact same in the exact same way that you're describing and that you do an exam and you kind of forget all about all all of the contents the moment you leave the exam room and the medical students who came to shadow me were studying for those ex the specialty that I was in. So they were were exceptionally book smart on on the specialty that I was rotating in, which was gastro. But when it came to the nitty gritty of dealing with patients um, in terms of like, you know, electrolyte disturbances or AKIs or um, hypo, um, hypo uh, glycemic instances, whatever the case, the basics, they the, the medical students weren't able to handle those kind of things much like I wouldn't have been able to handle those kind of things in med school so I, I feel like the foundation training gives you that opportunity to learn the breadth of medicine very superficially before going into your speciality so, so I want to go into ENT for instance I'm not gonna to have to deal with a lot of cardiac issues throughout my ENT training if I get into it but to know how to manage the basics of cardiac issues before I speak to a cardiologist will put me in good stead so it's, it's that kind of breadth of knowledge that I appreciate the foundation program for. But I think there's a lot of things in the British system that are very, very superfluous. OK, I mean, this is definitely something I do want to discuss, like when it comes to the pros and cons. But I guess for me, I'm more curious because like when I talk to a lot of students, they have this severe anxiety that because uh, the Italian system doesn't have a lot of practical training that they're not going to be able to do anything once they start specialty. For me, this is not really a concern because I, I think you can learn a lot of practical skills in a very short amount of time if you have a good theoretical knowledge. Um, so I guess like w when the Italian school system, like I guess my question was more kind of like the preparation in the Italian school system did you think it was enough that you could survive or did you feel like it was severely lacking? Like, I, I don't know how to better phrase it, but like, uh, is Italian medical school enough to give you a good foundation when you start the foundation program, which is completely different? Um, I think I'm going to be a kind of against the curve here in saying that I think, yes, it gives you the bare minimum that you need to to be able to prepare yourself for the foundation program. I know a lot of my colleagues and a lot of people come through the IMS system, at least in Milan, will disagree with this. Um, but in in the foundation tr program, you are still a trainee. It's not there's a lot of service provision, but your main focus is still to train, um, and you're at the very bottom rung of the ladder there. So it's not expected of you to be able to manage the most wild and wonderful things as a doctor because you always have senior you should always have senior help i have heard instances where where f1s have made mistakes that should not have been made at all if they had um, adequate senior help or supervision but on the same token i suffered a lot with anxiety and performance anxiety at my job when i was in the first um three or four months of the foundation program you get a clinical supervisor and an educational supervisor. Both of mine um, were exceptional in my first rotation um, and allowed me provisions to get extra training outside of the outside of the foundation program. So they made me supernumerary for a short spell of time so that I could attend certain medical training for with medical students. And um, that put my mind at ease a lot because I realized then go by by seeing how the British medical students do things with their with their PBLs and their um, their problem based learning and their um, their um, scenario training and the simulation training that I'm not actually or I wasn't actually that far detached from them in terms of my clinical expertise. Um, the other point you mentioned is the practical side of things, and I, I fully agree. The Italian system doesn't train you up for the practical side of things because their side of their their medical system doesn't have to deal. Your doctors don't have to deal with practical procedures most of the time. Blood taking cannulas and um, ABGs are all things that are expected of foundation program doctors to be able to handle. But in the Italian system, um, at least the cannulas and the and, and the normal bloods uh, nurses do all of those abgs i'm not sure um but 
at least in my experience and at least of two of the experience of two other people that I've spoken to who have also started foundation training recently, you get simulation training prior to starting foundation training. So you have a shadowing block of maybe two weeks before you start the job. And in those two weeks, you shadow F1s at, at the end of their F1 journey at the moment, um, see what they're doing. They train you up to do their job on that special uh, specialty that you're entering, entering into, and they give you simulation training on how to take bloods and how to cannulate. Obviously, that's not enough. When I first took my set of my first set of bloods and my first set of cannulas, it took me about an hour a piece. Now, at the end of my uh, at the start of my F two training, I can whip in a cannula. I can take bloods in in less than five minutes. It's not a problem. Um, these practical skills, person dependent, that they don't take too long to learn, in my opinion. And it was hard for me to learn these in the Italian system. I even picked an internship at a transfusion center in Milan just to learn how to take bloods and they was there was so much friction um for them teaching me how to learn how to take bloods because they didn't think i'd need it rightfully so um and i think i was there for a month and they only gave me one day of blood taking training and i never took bloods again so. <laughs> yeah that's that's really interesting i mean um in my experience like i i asked to do a night shift in the er uh we have a great like we had great er professors um and over the night shift i asked the nurses if they could teach me how to take blood and they were like why do you want to learn how to take blood and i was like don't you think you should know it and it's like don't you think doctors have better time like things to do with their time but bet so they did actually sit down and take it and i was really nervous and the nurse like i took it from the nurse and then after i took it i realized it wasn't a big deal at all and they were like okay for the rest of the night you can do all the bloods and i was like <laughs> I don't want to do it. I actually don't want to do it. Like once you do it and you realize it's not a big deal, I, I like that really, really put it in my mind that like I don't care about what practical things I know and don't know because I realize that sure I'm going to be super nervous and problematic, but I think once you do it a few times, you realize that actually gets pretty boring. Um, yeah. After a while, uh, regarding actually, the ABGs. Oh, sorry. No, I was no. just going to say like there, there's some patients where like you've taken bloods the whole day and every single one's been easy, and then you get challenging one, then you're like, oh okay finally a challenge something for me to rise up to but sorry you were saying no no uh in my vascular for my surgical tirocinio i had to do it in vascular and uh there the surgeons do do the abgs but when i did the er night shift it was the nurses that did it so i think it's just whatever whoever's there whatever's convenient um in the uk only doctors at least in the in the hospitals i've worked in only doctors are allowed to take abgs yeah, I think there's a lot of differences, but I realize that I've become very like Italian in my way of thinking that I've become very, very laid back about these things like, oh, practical things, Meh, I'll learn it when it <laughs> like when the time comes. But so regardless of your difficulty of learning how to take blood, it didn't massively impact your standing now, like you still manage to adapt, overcome, survive, whatever the, <laughs> the <laughs> mantra is. Yeah, definitely did. Definitely. Um, I mean, every every good day that I have is always followed by a bad day. Um, but the worst days are far and few between now. Um, after one year of training, I feel like I can handle most of the basics, knocking on wood. Um, <laughs> but when it comes to things that really scare medical students and foundation doctors, like in terms of medical emergencies, I've not had to deal with a lot of those so far. And when I have had to deal with them, um, the medical registrar is always available most of the time or your seniors sh seniors should always jump in to help you so now that i'm an f2 and i'm one of the seniors that needs to jump in and help the f1s it's nice to see how far i've come from me being that person asking for help so much as a, a as a first month f1 to now being able that person who's being asked for help being able to manage it um yeah i think I have a lot of friends who are starting the foundation program this year, well, last month, two months ago now, um, who are handling it very well, a lot better than I did. So I think that's reassuring as well. Yeah. Um, the Okay, so to talk generally about the foundation year program, at least currently how it works, because, you know, next year they're introducing this exam and it's going to change the selection, blah, blah, blah. Let, let's not get into that. Currently, the way it works is you select six rotations over two years, right? Yep. Okay. Four months. So four months uh, over six that you kind of have a choice in. Yeah. Yeah. So 
the ranking system is really long um but you rank the deanery you want to go to and then the hospitals within that deanery that you want to go to and then the cer certain tracks within that hospital, um, all of which are regimented. Um, so three in one hospital usually and then three in another hospital usually, but all within the same geographical area. Um, and they tend to be a little bit themed, um, but most of them have a, a good balance of medicine and surgery for the first two years. Yeah, what what I've heard from uh, a lot of my friends in the UK is that they get shuffled around hospitals quite often. Like they find a nice house to rent, which is also very difficult depending on where you are. But then it's like, OK, now you have to go live in this other place where it's just far enough that you can't take public transport, but you need to then get rid of your house for a few weeks. Like, how does this shuffling work? Like, how often is it? How long is it? How problematic is it? So this is a major gripe of junior doctors currently um, and I think it is a, a big contributing factor to why a lot of doctors feel undervalued and underappreciated at the moment because this rotational system of either four or six months depending on which training program you're in so so to come back to the basics like the foundation program um, from what I've looked into to the hospitals that I've seen and from my colleagues experiences it's usually a year in one hospital and a year in another um, which is reasonable amount is a reasonable amount of time to kind of find a house that you can get a, a 52 week contract in and and be okay with however when you get into the post foundation program training program so your core surgical training or your uh, medical uh, inter internal medical training that kind of training path they do six month rotations and it can be six months in one hospital and then six months in a hospital that's 40 minutes away and then another six months in um, a hospital that's another 40 minutes away so that's where I think it gets a little bit trickier um, okay so the shuffling happens after the foundation year programs not during um, it can happen during um, but most programs will put you in one place for a year okay okay I mean that's that's a bit more reasonable because uh, I guess like in my mind I wasn't paying too much attention when they were complaining, oh, now I have to go here. I just assumed they were still junior doctors, maybe. Um, I don't know if they started their core training. Okay, uh, that, that's a bit more uh, reasonable. Junior docs is, is all the way from where your foundation one all the way to just before you become a consultant. So even ah. some of the experience is still considered a junior doctor, which is Okay, passive. okay. Okay, because I thought you were referred to as a junior doctor during your foundation years, and then once you start your core training, it's something else. Okay, okay. Well, maybe they should call us baby doctors instead. Maybe. Be, yeah. Okay, so the shuffling is not as much of a problem until after you graduate. You still have to do exams in foundation years, right? Um, for international medical graduates, you'll have to do something known as the PSA, the Prescribing Safety Assessment Exam. Um which is basically your ability to understand and use the BNF online and the CKS guidelines for the most part. But um, I've had a handful of my IMG colleagues struggle with this exam. I failed it once myself, um, again, because the British system brings you up to kind of use the BNF all the time and um, their prescribing and pharmacology lectures all use the BNF um, a lot. Whereas in Italy, um, I think I saw one BNF lying around in one hospital once and I got really excited when I saw that. Um, and you can't even access the NIC guidelines outside of the UK. So it becomes a lot more difficult to study for that exam. But given most people, most people say if you have two to three weeks to study for that exam, it'll be fine. And that's the only written exam that you have in foundation. And then you have to pass your in uh, intermediate or immediate life-saving skills exam or ILS and then your advanced life-saving skills ALS uh, before you pass out for foundation two. Oh, okay but there's no like um, like at the end of a rotation you do an exam because I okay I don't know where I imagined this information from then again because I thought that like once you complete the rotation you do an exam of that specialty to make sure no. that you have the minimums. No, um, it's competency based and sign off based. So you have to maintain a portfolio. And in that portfolio, you have to have documented reflections of, 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 of learning points that you've seen yourself and reflected upon, which is 
making like a diary, like a 15 year old to, <laughs> to, to, to document your medical journey and then sign offs for um, procedural skills or uh, evaluation of medical expertise or clinical decision making. Um, and a senior has to see you do that and sign you off for it. So F1 is competent, competency based, and then you continue that portfolio into F2, um, where it's a bit more just sign off based. You don't have to ch prove as many competencies as, as before. And then at the end of the year, your portfolio gets, um, gets uh, evaluated by the foundation program leaders and their team um, in something known as an ARCP. Um, I can't remember what that acronym's for, but um, yeah, that happens every year as a doctor. So even after you finish the foundation program, if you want to maintain your GMC standing, um, you have to get an ARCP sign off every single year, all the way up until past consultancy, actually. So you go to the hospital, you do your day of work, and then you go home and you fill out your portfolio. Yeah, not every day. I don't do it every day, but I will. I will slot aside maybe three or four hours a week to, to just make sure that anything that I've done um, that week I'm I'm adding into my portfolio and because I want to be a core surgical trainee I also have to maintain a surgical logbook of all the surgeries that I observed performed supervised taught others all that, all those kind of things okay so the portfolio has like a twofold uh, purpose let's say one is to make sure that you're competent and you're learning stuff so instead of an exam you just fill this out and the second one is like kind of like a cv builder then yeah yeah because okay. when you go in to apply for your inter internal medical training obs and gynae core surgical training they'll look at your portfolio as well to see how um, engaged with the process you are yeah so because this is definitely the other thing that i wanted to talk to about because again a lot of my information comes firsthand from uk students who are there and uh, a lot of them have told me multiple times, like this is not an isolated source, that you are at a severe disadvantage going in as an IMG for competitive specialties. Um, and they said this especially because for them, they start in medical school doing publications, research papers, the shadowings, the competencies, the log books, et cetera. And then the foundation mm -hmm. training is just like rounding that off and it's like adding already. So if you come in as an IMG, uh, not only is it harder for you to get into a good foundation program because of the way the ranking works, but also you don't have the same amount of time for like publications and related thing and the connections and the relationships that are needed to actually apply to something competitive. Um, and ENT is competitive or, I mean, I know surgical is more competitive than internal medicine. Mm. Um, so yeah. like, what do you think about coming in as an IMG? Like, do you think? So yeah, I fully agree fully agree i i have a colleague at the moment who's um who has almost so 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 to enter into core surgical training, just to admit, take an example you need for the highest points for your surgical experience on your portfolio you need to have been either assisting or performed 40 cases um prior to your application um I'm just about getting to that threshold now. And that's after three surgical rotations in both foundation one and foundation two. And that was a slog. I had to um, sometimes come in on my off days. Um, I had to really not fight with colleagues, but like, but, but, but say, I want to go to theater to, to help with this case. Um, are you okay to look after the ward whilst I go do that? And then sometimes there'd be friction. Sometimes you would be able to get away. Whereas a lot of the, people who come from British um, system have already got those 40 cases just by um, being a med student and engaging with the core surgical training process as a med student. And on top of that, um, again, your things like your PSA, um, things like, um, like, like you said, the connections, a lot of these are lacking uh, or add to the, to the, to the, to the stress of being an F1 as an IMG. Um, so I definitely think the, the British medical school graduates have the one up there, which is not to be unexpected. I mean, they just like if I was to enter into the Italian system, not knowing Italian would put me in a worse stead, or my level of Italian would make it harder for me to do the job in Italy. There's um, benefits and caveats I mean, to both. Though in the Italian system, it's standardized with one exam. Like if you get your Italian together and study for the exam, you have the same chance for any competitive specialty as you do with an Italian student. 
right? Whereas like my gripe mainly with the foundation program is that you can do this huge slog for two years, maybe even three, do an extra foundation year just to build out your CV and still not get into the specialty you wanted because it's competitive and you're an IMG. Whereas at least with the Italian system, okay, you learn Italian, you do the exam, you get your points, you know instantly if you got into your competitive specialty or not. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, you you are right. Yeah, I think that's yeah, you're right. It's also a lot more competitive now, um, than it was say two or three years ago because they've changed the way that certain specialities um you apply for them essentially. So for core surgical training now, you never used to have to do um this this one exam known as the multi speciality recruitment assessment or the MSRA. Uh, not to be confused with MRSA, which I do all the time. Um, but they're incorporating this exam now for application to almost every medical, sp- uh, every specialty apart from medicine who have their own, I believe. Um, and as a surgeon, a lot of people who have applied for surgery now have real gripes with this exam because it includes a lot of things that they'll, ne- they'll have to study for and then never use again um and it also means that pay, people who are applying for certain specialities who just want to hedge their bets with other specialities increase the competition uh, competition ratio so say if i want to do radiology but i kind of like surgery and just want to have that as a backup i can apply for both do the exam for both and then that increases the uh, competition for the surgeons who want to do the core surgical training same with the radiologists so the competition ratio for the core surgical trainees at the moment i believe is about three Point seven. the last time I looked at the statistics and that's actually that's dropped too bad. yeah so three three almost four people for every one spot but I think that's gone down because of the increased volume of applicants if that makes sense hmm. but uh so this new introduced exam is that to standardize the field a bit more like obviously yeah okay that makes sense and a bit of RNG as well I think and what's that? What's an RNG? Uh, uh, random number generating to just make it a bit another hoop to jump through to to cut off a certain amount of people who wouldn't be who would apply for this exam, get to a, uh, apply for this specialty, get to put um, interview, and just actually not be a candidate. Um, I think they just introduce an exam to cut off a certain okay. amount of okay. um, yeah burden on that. Other so just to increase the barrier for those who don't really want it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's a better way of putting it. No, 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 just uh, just to make sure that I'm understanding everything. And then uh, publications, how does that come into it? Like, because you need to do research as well, right? Yeah. yeah. And another gripe I have with the foundation program is that you're expected to do these things called, uh, called audits or QIs, which is essentially improving the service of the hospital compared to national guidelines or national standards. Um, and a lot of this work you have to do either in your own time or juggling your clinical duties and it is it's just useless in my opinion um useless for, for me as a trainee it's really helpful for the hospital really helpful for the speciality that you're doing it for but um they're making so so again to, to for me to apply for core surgical training they're looking at the amount of audits that, that i've done they're looking at the amount of quality improvement projects that i've done and the amount of um, good quality research that i've done um and when compared with medical graduates who have already got all of this from med school um it just makes it all that more difficult so yeah i think that's also a, a difficult part of the foundation program as an img um is this research and audit stuff um but i've had a lot of opportunities to engage with that process just by being for lack of a better word um annoying to my seniors and just badgering them all the time for um chances to get onto audits or quality improvement or research this is a really 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 difficult question but do you feel you're at least at a little bit of an advantage because you're British like do you think if you yeah Yeah, okay so you do feel that even though you're an IMG being British still makes you better like suited uh situated I guess to advance definitely I mean not from a not from an applying point of view but from what I don't have to deal with as a non-actual international uh, medical 
graduate, if that makes sense. So like, I don't have to ha deal with visa issues. I don't have to deal with the language barrier. I don't have to deal with finding a house without any references. I don't have to, f I don't have to try and find a bank account without having an address and not being able to get an address without a bank account and then not being able to get paid because of, I don't have a bank account. All yeah, of these but things. Listen, but exactly. we're coming from Italy. This is, this is our bread and butter. This is nothing exactly. to us, you know, like that, that's my breakfast, like stupid bureaucracy fine but like well, your day to day is a lot easier in the uk than compared to italy ah so what's the problem no i'm just kidding um, <laughs> but like in your day-to-day -day, in your interactions i'm not asking like an element of like racism or anything like that that's not what i'm uh asking but like do you think for example your badgering of asking for things might be better tolerated because you understand like british social cues better and by being british you might be shown a bit more favoritism if that makes sense. Hard to say. I think maybe. I think that's definitely a possibility. Um, just trying to check my bias here or check my privilege even, sorry. Um, but I think that is that there is an element of that because without tooting my own horn, I am well-spoken. I am able to engage with the British public um, without as much anxiety as, say, someone who is from an international background. But on the other side, when it comes to my peers, um, a lot of junior doctors who aren't in training or a lot of junior doctors who are what is known as SAS doctors or specialist doctors are from um, foreign backgrounds. They are um, expats into, into the UK. They, um, they understand the struggles as well. And yeah, for the, for the most part, actually, most of my seniors have been non-UK born nationals. So I think that alleviates a lot of the issues peer to peer, but everything else outside of that from being just an international person is, is, is difficult. Hmm. Okay. So you do feel at a bit like just to summarize, cause, uh, the last 20 minutes, you do feel at a bit of a disadvantage being an IMG for yes. competitive specialties. Um, ENT, you said, was it like, do you, because for example, if you wanted something like, let's say cardiac surgery, which is probably extremely competitive. Would you think you have good chances as an IMG or would you think it's not even worth thinking about? Like, I, I just really want to understand because this is something that I hear all the time and I want to get it like firsthand for everyone who's wondering it. Like, do you think coming in as an IMG is still worth it even though it's an extremely competitive specialty and you're dead set on it? Hard to say. Um, in, in six years from now, if I was to engage with the British program, I'd still only be six years out of eight into my ENT training, whereas six years from now in the Italian system, I would be a maestro. I'd be the consultant ENT doctor, I think. Or I'd at least be at the end of my training. I wouldn't be a, a trainee anymore. So the, just from a pure time point of view and competitive point of view, it definitely is better to stay in Italy. Um I mean, not necessarily staying in Italy, because I don't really want to make it a UK versus Italy thing. But like, for me, I think it's I kind of wish I understood the because before I applied to medicine, right, I was like, oh, if I study medicine anywhere, I'll be a doctor and I can apply anywhere. Like, I didn't realize that being an IMG severely hinders you when it comes to postgrad training, depending on where you go. Like, for example, if you want to go to the US as an IMG or to Australia as an IMG, um, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. So like, do you think as an IMG going into the UK for a competitive specialty is worth it? Or do you think it's not worth taking that risk because you are at such a disadvantage? I mean, I'm not that competitive of a person, um, but I do feel that my, I do feel my chances of getting into core surgical training are a lot lower compared to my peers just because of the amount of evidence and portfolio and everything else that I've been able to build in two years is not as much as everyone else who's had an extra five years to build has, has got. Um, there's definite drawbacks to that. Um, but on the same token, British trained doctors are sought after, or at least they were. They were very sought after if you were a British a trained doctor you could almost get a job anywhere provided you knew the language and you were able to get into their um um enrollment processes or an entry processes taking australia for, as an example a lot of foundation doctors are um, uh, emigrating to 
to Australia for a better life out there. I uh, I have to say, like one of the only reasons that's tempting me, like with the foundation program, is the ease to then go to Australia afterwards, compared to being in Italy. Um, it is a lot easier. It is, but also I've heard good and bad things about the Australian experience from a foundation. There's always good and bad things. <laughs> Everywhere yeah. has good and it's just it's just about. Uh, figuring out your tolerance for the amount of shit that you can put up with like that's yeah. it like there's never yeah. going to be a good choice an ideal place a place that you love and everything is perfect it's all about what is like the most amount of stuff that i am willing to suffer through <laughs> for me at least which is a really depressing way of looking at it but it's so true <laughs> that's just life to be honest so yeah. you okay sorry so img definitely makes it harder not necessarily impossible you yeah. still fare your chances. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, it, it makes it a bit harder for foundation training. Um, but I think once you get into the speciality, like once you, once you pass the MSRA and you get into your speciality of choice and you start that training journey, I don't think you are at any further disadvantage compared to your peers. As long oh, as you're no, engaging. No, no. Like, I, I don't think once you get to that stage, there's a problem. For me, the problem is, like, getting to that stage. Like, doing yeah. the two years of the foundation, the three years of the core surgical training, and then you don't get <laughs> what you actually yeah. have been gunning for for the past five years. Um, yeah. That's more my, like, like that lost time investment. Because I think if you're kind of easygoing, you don't really know what you want to do. Like, the UK system is great. You get to try different things. You get to see what life is like in those specialties. And then you can kind of apply for it. You can take an extra year to build your portfolio to actually do that. But my problem is, like, you blood, sweat, and tears five years to try and get into this one specialty. And then it's just like, nah. Yeah. Yeah, which I, I, I really hope is not the case for me. But something in the back of my head is like yes that's well why why even bother applying because it, the, the four other people applying for my one spot are probably going to be a lot more suit uh, not uh, a lot more evidence um hold a lot more evidence compared to me so no i definitely understand that point but you got to try aren't you you got to you got to give it a go sure but after the three years the core surgical training is three years right two two years Ah, two years and then you have then you pick an actual surgical specialty yeah so there are some run through so like for cardiothoracic i think they have their own training program that's a run through um, ent used to be a run through about three or four years ago but they stopped it they might bring it back but they stopped it but otherwise the surgical training part is themed so the core surgical part can be themed and um, for ent i think you do max fax ent some gen surge and then you apply for your surgical training or st um number and once you have that number that's it you're you're set until you get to consultancy okay so sorry so you do two years what? you apply for core surgical training you do two years yep. depending and then you apply again for surgical sub... training okay, which is surgical. six six years Okay, so another six years on top of that. And at every stage of the process, there's elimination and competitiveness ratios or whatever. Or do you think once you get into your core surgical training, it's guaranteed you get what you want? Like getting into core surgery is the problem. And then after that, it's easy. Or do you think that's just the start of it? From the seniors that I've spoken to, it's all about getting your number. So once you get your surgical training number so after you've done core surgical training you apply for your surgical number and once you get that everyone everyone kind of just takes their foot off the pedal and they don't do audits anymore they don't do qis they don't do anything like that they just they they do their um they do what they want um surgery wise and they try and build on their on their database of portfolio experience so the the number but the number still doesn't specify the subspecialty that you're going to go into um at that point i don't know how it works i've not gotten okay. i've not read <laughs> I, I, it's like, no, no, no. The... I should have but i don't know but um i think you when you get your number it's for a, a certain training pathway mm -hmm. so if i want to go into ent i do core surgical training i'd apply for so, uh, ent surgical training year one and then once i get my my training number for that training p pathway i'm on that pathway um it's like a consultant level Okay, okay. Honestly, that, that doesn't sound as bad as I thought it would, but yeah. I think but the it's... job is a lot of service provision, I think, at that point. 
Mm, okay. Um, what else? Is there anything that you wish you knew before you went over? Like, was what you were expecting severely different than what you got? I kind of went in with a with an empty mind, to be honest. Um, okay. Um, I think I wish I knew about the PSA um, mm. earlier, and I, I I think I wish I trained for it a bit earlier just because that exam gave me a lot of anxiety because if you don't have if you don't pass that exam at least in my hospital if you didn't pass that exam within the first year um you wouldn't be able to continue on to foundation training too and there were only three training uh there were only three exam dates in the year one of which was cancelled because of strikes so i failed the first one and then i only had one more to sit it and pass it and i did Other than okay. that, no, nothing really. Just maybe the basics of what is expected of a, of, of a junior doctor at that level. Um, so how to manage AKIs, how to manage hypertension, how to manage different glycemic states, um, and how to um, chase bloods appropriately for the pathology that you're interested in. That's about it. Because that's all. Like A lot of British medical grad, uh, graduates are told, or British medical students are told that they're being trained to be safe doctors when they enter into F2 and then in F1 and F2 is when they'll get their main training. So I think what it means to be a safe doctor, learn about that if you wish to go into foundation training. Hmm. So since you brought up the strikes, uh, I think this is a great opportunity to talk about two yeah. other criticisms I hear. Like I, I want to uh, make it clear that I'm not trying to attack the system at all, like the UK foundation program. I think just, people should be super aware of like what they can expect. Because for example, I did a similar interview with someone from IMG who's doing their residency in Italy and they're in a surgical program. And they like, they told me, I don't know if they said this during the interview that they're basically being paid three euro an hour. Um, so let's talk honestly about, uh, you don't have to go into the specifics of your pay, but let's talk about like the compensation, the cost of living and how hard you're working aside from of course you have to do all of this portfolio and qi and audits and this unnecessary grunt work it feels like um yeah. for cv building yes. um okay so wherever you want to start <laughs> so i don't know all the statistics i probably should because i do engage with the strikes apart from the, the last not, three days not statistics like just t first do you feel like you're fairly compensated for the work you do no <laughs> no. I think in, in foundation year I was getting paid 14 pounds an hour which which is not horrific but six years of training dealing with life and death on a on a daily basis it just feels very underwhelming and in my first six months of being an F1 I didn't leave on time a single day a single day I did not leave on time um there's always stuff to be done and like and whilst you can hand over jobs to the night team a lot of it feels inappropriate because these are your patients your responsibility and i wouldn't want anyone else who doesn't know the patient dealing with um things i hand over most of the time um i don't i still don't feel adequately compensated because you also have to deal with a lot of excuse my french a lot of shit that comes with dealing with the general public like the amount of The amount of abuse you get as a doctor just from from like relatives from patients themselves it's hey but their taxes are paying your salary rosh don't you no, know no, no. you work for them yeah, i pay my I own way yeah, i pay my own taxes <laughs> true true <laughs> but it's, it's not like we're asking for a pay rise we're asking for pay to meet the rate of inflation so i don't oh, yeah. think I'll... the whole restoration thing is absolutely fucked don't even excuse my french like it's something like th it should be 30 percent higher just to match inflation rate from like a few years ago I, i was following this but it's more my question is um like so what's what what are your hourly like what's your weekly hours like both paid and not paid like how many hours are you doing realistically in the hospital i know it's going to massively change from rotation to rotation but if you could give like a realistic estimate for someone considering the foundation program when i was on gastro my first four months of foundation i was working easily 60 60 to 70 hours a week and um, we all have to sign contracts when we start that say that 
Um, we're okay with working above the the national limit, which is 45, I believe. Um, and then I went into ENT and then hours reduced significantly, but I was still work. Some days I would finish three hours late. Some days I'd finish a, an hour late. I would say at that point, I was probably working a good 50 hours a week. And then when I went on to general surgery, it bumped straight back up to maybe uh, 55 to 60 a week. Um, and this doesn't include all those shifts where you're doing out of hours or you're doing silly shifts from like 4 p.m. to 12 at night when um, if you don't drive, you've got to sort public transport or if you've got kids, you've got to sort out child care for really odd shifts that only happen once or twice um, every two months. It's it's a lot to juggle for your own life compared to someone who just works a nine to five Monday to Friday. Um, and I don't think that's fairly compensated, especially when you consider like if you do night shifts, you no one, no one in their in their right mind has the appropriate level of cognitive function to deal with clinical decision making on a night shift, which is why the, the motto of a night shift is just keeping them alive till the day team gets there because that's all you should be doing. Um, I, I just I, do, I don't feel like I was adequately compensated then and I don't for, feel like I'm compensated. For, like when you say some weeks you work 60 to 70 and others, do you get the 14 pounds for each of those hours? Yeah, there's no such thing as time and a half over time. It's, uh, no, no, but yeah. like you, you do get paid for every single hour you clock in because for example, the Ah, okay. Because the problem with the Italian system is you get a flat salary no matter how many hours you work a week. Um, right. So, for guys, so, for, yeah. so for us, we're meant to do something called exception reporting. So once we, if if you miss out on study time, if you miss out on your lunch break, or if you have to work overtime, you exception report the hours that you um, are in deficit or you've overworked. Um once you make that application for exception report for say i worked an hour overtime yesterday i make that exception report it gets sent to my clinical supervisor and if my clinical supervisor is someone who doesn't agree with exception reporting then i'm fucked um because you do get some doctors who are like this is a vocation it's not a job you shouldn't be logging overtime if you have to work you have to work why become a doctor if you don't want to do the job that kind of bullshit, right? Uh, tell me you have rich parents without telling me you have rich parents. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Tell me, it's just the baby boomer generation into it, really. But that aside, you do get some um, a, a clinical supervisors who are like, yes, you should be exception reporting everything. How can we make the service better for the people who work there unless we know um, with objective data that you're working overtime because the job is just too hard for X amount of people to handle. Um, so it differs from clinical supervisor to clinical supervisor. Um, but even when you accept and report that one hour, they won't pay you for it. They'll try and give it you back in lieu. So they'll give you annual leave um, allowance for that for that time. But depending on how much overtime you've worked, that could be like a half a day throughout the four months that you get back, you know, or, or like when I was on gastro and I accept reported a lot, I got maybe three days back, which was quite significant. Um, um the well, portfolio hours and all of that other good stuff that doesn't count in your hourly consider like your your pay i guess like oh, you said you do four hours a week right you're not compensated for those four hours no but you are given study time so you're given can't remember how many hours a month but you're 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 given a lot of time off of the ward no clinical duties to to do this kind of stuff Paid. Yes. Okay. Decreased okay. rate, but still paid. I think. Okay. I mean, that that feels kind of fair. I don't know. That seems. I mean, not fair. It seems nice enough that yeah. at least you, you get to have. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Priorities. I, I don't know. I, <laughs> for all intents and purposes, I don't take it as a day off. <laughs> no. No. Um. So, okay, so essentially when you have to stay late, you report it. When you don't take your lunch break, you report it and you hope to get compensated. You have kind of paid study time where you can catch up with paperwork and uh, do your portfolio and other good things. Um, so in general, okay, so let's say ideally you get 
paid for all of those hours. But in case you don't and you're stuck with your base salary, no matter how many hours you work. Um, I know cost of living, again, changes massively from place to place. But do you think it's a livable wage? Because sometimes I see on the Foundation Doctor subreddit really, really sad posts like, hi, guys, like, uh, I have to buy beans again, but they're after going up 10 cents in Aldi and I can't afford them. Uh, like, what do I do? And I'm like, bro, you're, you're a doctor. What do you mean you can't afford beans? Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. so depressing. So I'm it, curious, like... I'm, I, so I'm quite privileged that I don't have to worry so much. Um, I've got a great support network thing that can that can help me out with a lot of things. Um but if I was to be doing this on my own, no, no safety net, no support network, I would be struggling a lot. Um, cost of living crisis is a crisis for a reason and it, it touches everybody. And I mean, I, I know a lot of my colleagues who don't, um, who don't drive, who have to take public transport, who can't um, afford to eat even the hospitals deduced rates for lunch and dinner and breakfast and um, they have to cook at home and meal prep every day and i i just don't think that's um something that people in our profession should have to to deal with um i don't know it's gonna sound really um uh, big-headed or boorish but i don't feel like doctors in society should have to 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 penny pinch so much um why no i i I get what you're saying i i feel like people will split on this but to me at the end of the day being a doctor is still a job you deserve to be compensated the barrier of entry is six years of blood sweat and tears and it's of like a fair expectation that you get fairly compensated after six years because otherwise you can go into any other degree and make a lot more so clearly there's something else that's drawing us but i don't think yeah i don't think that should mean that you should have to you know count beans and not turn your heating on during the winter after you've put so many years into getting to that stage Um, yeah i didn't turn on my heating at all last winter (laughs) (laughs) um yeah kind of that shit. so cost of living high Pay is better than Italy, but still hard to live Three on. Three euros is crazy. How do people live on that? Be- the, the thing is, like the way he was explaining it, and I guess we can just mention this to compare it, is that uh, in Italy, you don't get a salary, you get a grant. So you get, no matter what specialty you do, you get, I think it's like 1,500 a month or something. You don't pay taxes on it because it's a grant. Um, you have to pay your school fees. So which is also crazy to me, but it brings it down to about 1,400 a month uh, net. And the minimum hours are 40 hours a week. But if you want to go into surgical training, which starts early, where you have to stay late, where you have to kiss ass, you have to do extra, like none of that is compensated. Um, So like, I think uh, the guy was staying in the hospital from, I don't know, like 7 a.m. because it's surgical and going home at 10 p.m., just doing extra casework, doing extra things, doing to get better surgeries, to be able to, you know, build the career. But again, because it's grant based, his flat pay is 1,400. So when he cut his technical hours in hospital, even though it's not technically his work hours, it was working out to be something crazy, like three euro an hour. If you go into psychiatry or dermatology, that's 38 hours a week with no, you know, emergency shifts, night shifts, blah, blah, blah. I mean, psychiatry, a bit different. Um, you know, it's a pretty good pay, 1,400 a month tax-free for 38 hours a week. But yeah, that's how, like, that's why it's so massively different. Mm. Fair enough. I, I, like, I knew about the having, still having to pay university fees, which is... That's mental to me. Asinine, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> that's absolutely ridiculous. It was, it was, like, I was floored when I heard that. It was the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. But, you know, Italy. But for 1,000... <laughs> 1,400 a month. I don't think I'd be able to survive on that in Italy, in Milan, at least. Uh, Milan gives you... Okay, so this is like a completely different thing. I think Milan would be very hard, but there are extra borsa that you can apply to that helps with like cost of living um, mm. adjustment. But yeah, I think it's definitely tough. Depend, But, you know, if you're in a city like Bari, like 1,400 is <laughs> amazing. You can live like a king <laughs> for that money. Um, but anyway, so you don't feel fairly compensated, but... 
better than Italy, at least, I guess. Uh, cost yeah. of living is much higher in England, I assume. Um, yeah, I think I've, I've not looked into it, but I think so. But I also think this is only um, at my level here. Um, I think pay when you get into core surgical training is a bit fairer. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I don't have kids. I don't have to hold down a mortgage just yet. So uh, those are other things that I'm not factoring into to to the, li- the cost of living crisis that would hit someone of, of you know, that level. Okay. And then, okay. Okay. I'm just trying to think if there is anything more important to cover. We've been talking for an hour. Sorry. I, I asked oh, some really you. tough questions. I wasn't trying to attack the UK foundation program. But... Please attack me. It's, it's, it's got some shit aspects to it. I do appreciate that. Is there anything that, uh, like if you were watching this interview, you wished someone would know who's considering the UK, whether they're British or not? Um, I guess we can touch on like application process. But it's all pretty straightforward if you just go Google, a quick Google search. They're changing the application process. So that's why I'm a bit, because I had done an interview with another girl, like she had just finished applying. So just to go through it. But then she was like, but you know, it's all changing next year, right? And I was like, mm, maybe that's too. It's the MLA we're bringing in, right? Which is like the US MLA equivalent. Yeah, they're, they're calling it the UK MLA, which is so funny. It's just um, money grab. Yeah, I think that's a massive money grab because they're going to get all the UK med students to do it as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, I did hear that. But apparently it's meant to be better for IMGs because it's, again, standardizing things. I don't know. I'm a big fan of an exam. Like, I think, you know, because I feel like with enough time and commitment, like anyone can do well in an exam. And I feel like that's more fair than just because I'm a foreigner in a foreign country and I'm applying and then I have to get used to all these things. Like, mm. I, I, I don't know. I would take a standardized exam personally. True. But then I, I don't, I don't know how much, like again, for the PSA, for instance, how much are they going to prepare their own home born grads for that exam compared to an IMG's um, preparation just for geographical split, you know? In what sense? Like, I thought the UK MLA was basically going to be kind of like the concorso that they do here in Italy. Yeah, I, mean, I imagine it's going to be a lot like the PLAB as well. But I imagine if they're making their own med students take it, that they'll provide provisions during med school oh, to yeah, of course, of course. train towards it, where, where IMGs won't have that same uh, benefit. No, but for me, it's like the same thing as the US simile, you know, um, but as an IMG, if you get like 250 or before step one must pass fail, whatever, like, you know, you, you have a real fighting chance. Um, I thought the U- U- UK MLA was going to work in a similar manner. But again, admittedly, I haven't really looked into it. This is just based on someone telling me. Um, OK, OK. So I that's why I don't want to touch on the application process, because I'm afraid how they're going to change it. And yeah. it kind of becomes redundant. Um, I actually don't about that new <laughs> See this. <laughs> okay what about advice for someone who is that set on applying to the uk um nothing i don't think there's anything extra that to touch on that we haven't already touched on and um, practical skills you'll learn that um the basics of what it means to uh, the basics for your um your ward-based work you'll learn in the shadowing um, process if you're an IMG I think they give you most places will give you like an extra week as well of shadowing and um, I just appreciate that for most IMGs who graduate in the summer you may not have enough time to get there um, like mid-July when they want you to be there for those shadowing times depending on when you graduate um, actually yeah yeah actually even for the home uh, even for UK grads there was some there was one F1 that I was um supervising who had started the job and then had to go to her graduation the weekend after starting her job so i think the time constraints are still wait, very... wait 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 they started the foundation program before graduating they had graduated but they hadn't had the ceremony oh, okay i was like wait a I'm second <laughs> wait. <Yeah. laughs> something ain't right <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, I really have to go. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you so no, much no, no. for again. I'm sorry for missing yesterday. No, it's no yeah. problem. Um, if it would be okay with you, once I publish this, I can take some time to collect more questions, and if you would be up for it, maybe do a part two, or if there's anything. Oh. 
no pressure. Definitely. I can edit this part out in case you're like, no, I'm too busy. <laughs> Don't worry. No, no, no. I'm always, I'm always, you know, I'm always happy to be, uh, to be, to be interviewed. And if I get into core surgical training, um, I'll definitely be open for another interview as well. Let's any- go. <laughs> okay. Well, awesome. This was a really nice interview. Thank you so much, Raj. Yeah, it's good seeing you again as well.